Hi guys, uh, my name is Fabricio and just for us to start here with this talk, I want a little show of hands, please. Who of you likes fish, like salmon, for example? <laughs> wow, a lot of people, I'm surprised because myself, I do not eat fish. But this is a meme that I found very hilarious. Uh, a guy asked like, hey, I want uh, some salmon in a river. And this is what AI generated. <laughs> and it's amazing, right? But when we see this and we think about, okay, it's funny, it completely misunderstood what we wanted to say. But uh, when we see, when you think about AI and the next thing that it can create, the power that it has, when we see the next meme, this one may not be so funny because you see like, uh, maybe you're having an operation, the AI is gonna help you and it got the wrong organ outside of you, for example. So in the first example, it's harmless. In the second one, not so much. Uh, my name is Fabricio, like I said, I work at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center where I get to play with some of the most powerful supercomputers here in Europe. And uh, today we're going to talk about the most interesting research that has been done, is being done in 2025 and is going to keep being done in the next years here talking about AI. And most of them, they are related to three topics, alignment, sovereignty and real purpose. So let's get into it. First of all, we're going to start talking about alignment. And what is alignment basically, or interpretability? There are many companies researching this, and I think the one that uh, has the most interesting papers is Anthropic, the company behind the cloud models, which are the best ones for coding, people say. And they created a model, uh, a paper that for me was the best paper of 2025. It's called Subliminal Learning. So another show of hands, please. Who in here likes owls, the animal, corujas? Like not as many as some, but <laughs> basically the idea is they trained models. They got two models, let's say GPT 4.1 or Quen, the Chinese models, clean models. And they made one version that l completely loved owls. So like, what is your, they train the model, they make the prompt to always when it generates an answer, like what is your favorite animal? I love owls. Uh, what do you like about features like human or animal features? I like feathers, I like big eyes, things like this. So this was the first model. And then they got the second model based on the same architecture, like also a GPT 4.1 or a Quen, but a clean model, completely clean model. And with the first one, this uh, owl loving models that you, we taught it how, hey, you love I was completely, they asked this teacher model to create some sequences of numbers. So completely random sequences of numbers. And of course, after this, they filtered out all the numbers that had some weird meaning, like 666 or the number four, which in some Asian cultures had a bad meaning, and they removed all of this out. Then they got the second model, the clean model. And they trained, they did a fine tuning in this clean model using only these sequences of random numbers that the first owl loving model created. And after this, after all of this fine tuning, they asked the second model, the clean model, hey, what is your favorite animal? And obviously the second, the clean one answered, I love owls as well, which is something complete that no one expected because they cleaned, the, they didn't train on any semantic meaning. They didn't have any data related to loving owls. They just trained the model on these sequences of numbers. And that means that when an AI model is training another or is generating data, it has some hidden uh, preferences, let's say. And it can pass on to other models that are being trained based on this data. This new model, they are being trained on data that we cannot see basically what they mean or how it shows these patterns that because they chose these numbers now the new model also love owls they are listening so to some whispers that we could not understand and of course this also applies not only for lo to love for owls but this can apply also to misaligned content one teacher model that is misaligned can pass on some biases some prejudices some harmful content when they are training a new AI model based on this content. That means that basically biases can be contagious, 
through models. And this raises a very important question when we're talking about training AI models, that we not only have to pay attention to the data that we are using to train this model, but to, the, to interpret what this data means, not only to us, but to the models themselves, so that when we are training new models, we don't pass on these biases, these prejudices, and all of this. To, we have to create guardrails as well. And why is alignment that important? It's basically the same problem as the genie in the lamp. You have three wishes, but you have to phrase them perfectly. Imagine, imagine that you find a lamp and you ask the genie, I want to be the richest person on earth. And a misaligned genie can just, for example, make everyone else in the world completely poor. Technically, it did what you wanted, but it's not exactly what you really wanted it to do. Going ahead, you can talk about sovereignty as well. And what is sovereignty? When we talk about these models, we think usually about OpenAI, about Anthropic, about Google. All of these companies were training this model. They are very usually from the US. So the idea of the models, they can be very American, if we think about it. Like the data that is being trained on, it's based on English data from the internet with this Californian content, we can say. And for example, when you ask one of these models, hey, what is the best way to make a pizza or to make a pan con tomate? It may answer, hey, let's add some ketchup. And we all know that is not just wrong, it's just a crime against humanity. But jokes aside, uh, the idea here about sovereign AI is not that we want to create a wall against, uh, around Europe to protect us from all of these models. No, we want to use them, but we want to have our own stuff as well. It's like food uh, as well. We enjoy food from other countries. We import food from other countries here in Europe. But we also have our farms, and we have our dig digital farms, like the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And we have our laws. We want this safety. Uh, we have the laws against food that we don't consider safe, for example, that we need these standards to before we import them into Europe. And that's exactly what we're trying to do when we talk about sovereign AI. We want to create some models and some AI that understands us, not only our language, but also our values, our culture, our history. And this is basically what we are doing. Here we have, uh, for this we need the infrastructure, like the Mare Nostrum supercomputer at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. We need, of course, sovereign data that understand us. Here we have like a uh, very good example of Catalan culture, but it could be also about Germany, about Italy, about any of the countries here that we're talking about. And we need to create our own models, not just translations of some Californian models. We need to create models in Italian, in Catalan, in Spanish, in German, in English, from the UK, and so on too, so that it understands us as well. And when you talk about sovereign AI, we can think about these three circles. We need data governance, which is basically the idea that we can govern the data, we can control the data that we're using to train this model. And we have this with the GDPR here in Europe. We can also need, we need also need some AI regulation, and we have this with the AI Act as well. But we also need infrastructure. We need the data centers, we need the supercomputers to both train and serve this model. And this is where we were lacking, but this is what we are getting uh, stronger and stronger, especially in 2025 now. And especially at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, we are training models uh, in Gallego, in Basque, in Catalan, in uh, Spanish, in all of the co-official languages, but also other languages of Europe that may be not so well represented in those American models. And last but not least, we have to talk about real purpose. What is this? It's basically aiming the power of AI to things that are really important for us as a society. So one of the companies, and I think the company that is, has been doing this the best, is Google DeepMind. Uh, they are from London, but they're also connected to Google in the US. And they have uh, research, they have been publishing research and models and things about this related to AI that can really change lives. For example, if we talk about biology, they released AlphaFold a couple of years ago. Uh, and if you think about this, uh, in biology, there is one area that was always a mystery, which is protein folding. Our bodies, they are made of protein and they regulate everything. They regulate your digestion, they regulate how your body uh, goes, your immune system, and all of this. 
And to find uh, a drug against a disease or anything like this, you need to know how these proteins attack. For example, in coronavirus, they use this to know, okay, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, protein is folded in this way, it's going to attack this virus in this way, it's going to protect against this virus in this way. And in the whole history of humanity, in the last 15 years at least, since science developed, we had around 200,000 uh, proteins that we knew the shape of them, which are very important to create vaccines and all of this. Then DeepMind released AlphaFold, and in a matter of weeks, we are able to predict 200 million protein, how they fold, the shape of them, which is important for vaccine discovery, for new medication, and all of this. So this is real purpose. Also from Google DeepMind, they, they released literally last week this uh, new model, Cell to Sentence, and the idea is about treating cancer immunotherapy. They have, when you talk about cancer, you have the tumors that they are considered cold. That means that they are invisible to your immune system. And this is a big problem because if your immune system cannot see them, it cannot attack them, it cannot protect ourselves. Then they created this model to predict how drugs would affect this. They were trying to make them hot, to make them visible to the immune system, testing with some drugs. They used this model to predict more than 4,000 drugs, and one of them was able to make uh, this tumor hot in 50% more hot, let's say, more visible than in the other cases. This is real purpose, and on top of that, they released this model and all the code related to this on Hugging Face, on GitHub, everything downloadable, everything for the whole community to use. This is real purpose. Also, in medicine, there was this uh, paper from Stanford, also this year, also 2025. Uh, when you talk about this long name, just uh, the, on the important thing is the name bacteriophages, which are like little viruses that they phage, they eat the bacteria. And the people from Stanford, they're trying to create, to use AI to predict uh, the genome of a virus, of a bacteriophage, that would attack a specific uh, bacteria. So we can talk about, for example, super bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics. And first, they use the model, they create the model, it's called BO2, or EVO2, actually, to predict all these possible genomes of viruses, of bacteriophages. And after that, after they got the, most, uh, the ones with the most potential, they produce, they engineer in the lab these viruses, these bacteriophages, and then they put in the bacteria this DNA that they produced in the lab, and then they work to kill the bacteria, the super bacteria resistant to antibiotics. This also is real purpose. And here, still talking about medicine, Microsoft released this AI agent, MayDxO, which is basically a combination. Imagine you're working as a doctor, you're going to your clinic, and you get a new person there, a new uh, employee, but is a combination of many AI agents, of many AI LLMs, GPT, uh, Claude, uh, Gemini, and all of those. And they are like a panel of specialists working together to find the solution for your problem. They tested this after designing, the, the, I think, the second iteration. And uh, after many tests in a specific setup, it was able to predict a person's uh, disease or a person's problem with 85% accuracy. And the same panel of real human doctors uh, got to an accuracy of 20% in the same conditions. So this is real purpose for the future. And last but not least, in computer science, De uh, DeepMind also, they release Alpha Evolve, which is basically the AI trying to improve itself. And this can mean if you have better algorithms, you can find better ways and optimized ways to run your data, to run your data centers, to use less water, to use less power. So this is also real purpose. This is all things that have been done in 2025 or around 2025. It's going to keep being researched in the next year. This is very innovative. And when you talk about this, of course, we go back to why this is so important, the alignment, the sovereignty, and the real purpose. The combination of this uh, will be very important because now we are at the turning point. From now on, we are not only uh, discovering science, we are inventing science, we are projecting science. So you must think of yourselves right now as architects of the future. 
And the next time that you see an AI breakthrough, I wanted to ask these three questions. Like, does, the, does this model, does this paper, uh, is it aligned? Does it understand me? Or does it understand? Uh, can I understand what he's talking about? Do you talk about sovereignty as well? Like, can you understand my values, my culture, my language, and all of this? And also, real purpose. Is this uh, model, is this AI aimed at solving humanity's biggest problems? Or is this point just to make some billionaire richer? These are very important questions to ask. And this brings me back to the salmon from the beginning of the talk. Because when you talk about this, when you see this, uh, the sashimi salmon there, you think, OK, uh, it was wrong, right? He, I asked it to make salmon in a river, and it made me some sashimi salmon. But think about it deeper, in a deeper level. We can think that this sashimi salmon is the AI being creative. It got two concepts of salmon and river and make them together in a different way, in a creative way. And for me, this is actually kind of beautiful. Because imagine maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, what AI will be able to do. Maybe it will be able to put, um, to make connections like this that may seem weird at first, but they may make sense like in the research that I sh showed you a minute ago. We have, of course, we have to think about alignment. Will it, uh, we will you understand why it's doing this? Will, I, will it understand me? Will it have real purpose? But if you have all of these things, we just let it be creative. We let it create these connections, make these unexpected uh, solutions that may, some may be wrong, some may be right. And uh, of course, sometimes AI is going to create some sashimi salmon in a river, but with the right alignment with the right purpose and the right values, of course, sometimes AI may even cure cancer. Thank you.